coming up, 10 car makers that tanked in 2022. This should be pretty good for some abject hate mail. I'm John Logan from AutoExpert.com.au and I get new cars cheap, even from brands that tank. Like, dude, fundamentally, I don't care. I'm an equal opportunity car source and pimp of sorts in Australia only. Website, card. Now... Why should we care about this? Car makers doing badly. Do we need to poke them in the ghoulies when they're down? And I say emphatically, yeah, we do. A, because it's hilarious. The facts are often funnier than any satire one could dream up, any sort of fictional satire, at least, that one could dream up. So that's worth it in its own right. Who doesn't need a laugh at the expense of a multi-million dollar multinational? I know I do. But even more so if you're in the market for a car now and you are enamoured of a particular vehicle and you buy it and that car maker is developing a brown stain in its commercial trousers, if you have a legitimate problem with that car, then that car maker is going to be your in-law because you're married to the car. They're your in-laws and they might be the in-laws from hell. If you've got a legitimate problem, it's nice to get support. And when the balance sheet goes bad, the rug just immediately gets pulled out of things like support and spare parts inventory onshore and things like this as bean counters move in and do everything reasonable and unreasonable that they can to prop up the failing balance sheet. So that's something to consider. So in the light of the recent release of car industry sales data for the year end of 2022, I thought we would highlight the more um, abjectly shit performers, which you might like to just steer away from. That's next. This report is sponsored by NordVPN. Now, I'm not a hardcore IT guy, but I've heard enough, especially recently, about data breaches, scams and hacks to know that being online can be inherently risky and costly. You don't have to be tech savvy to use NordVPN. It's a simple one-stop cyber security solution. One click and you are protected from hackers, malware and pop-ups across as many as six devices. NordVPN is the world's fastest VPN. I don't even notice it running in the background, frankly, and it only costs about as much as a cup of coffee to keep your data, your identity, and your devices secure every month. NordVPN can also save you money because you can assign your virtual location to another country where, for example, flights and accommodation might be cheaper than they are back at home. The same goes for streaming services, and you can access live sporting events and other content that may not be available where you actually live. It's a pretty small price to pay for cyber security, not to mention the potential savings also on the table. Go to nordvpn.com slash AEJC to get a huge discount off your plan plus four months free. Totally risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. That's nordvpn.com slash AEJC. Link in the description. And thanks to Nord for sponsoring this episode. So I've got 10 car makers here, and by 10 I mean probably more like 13, but they're in 10 different categories, and we're going to go through them right now, starting with number 10 and working our way up to the urine coloured trophy, the golden shower of mediocrity in the car industry, bad commercial performance. This is all based on sales data, and I'm going to refer to my notes because there's a lot of facts to get through, as well as just abject taking the piss. So there's that. Number 10, Peugeot. The French brand, it has its supporters and you can count them on one hand typically at the moment, but it really does epitomise the myth of European build quality in my estimation. The frogs actually moved the distributorship in Australia to a company you may not have heard of called Inchcape, but you've heard of Subaru, right? Well, Inchcape imports Subaru into Australia, and they have done for many decades. And I had high hopes for this change to Inchcape, because Inchcape, if anyone can do it, Inchcape can, and unfortunately, they can't. 
This happened, this change in distributorship happened in May of 2017, interestingly enough. And since then, Peugeot's already abjectly crap sales have gotten even worse. They've just tanked. They're down from 3,400 annually in 2017 to just over 2,000 last year. That's a fall of almost 40% and there's no end in sight. You could put the spare parts inventory in my friggin' garage at this point, you know, which isn't all that comforting if you own a Peugeot. Citroen, interestingly, was also part of that deal. Their sales even worse. It also collapsed under Inchcape. I don't know why, but they're 60% down also. So that's a two-for-one of brands to avoid. Now, number nine. Who should we... Who should we pick on next? I think we should talk about the all-new Ranger and the trouser teepees all around, orbiting the launch of that car. I mean, every motoring journalist is walking around with an undignified lump in their trousers over the Ranger, and this is despite the engineering glitches that have come to light and the legally reprehensible non-disclosure agreements that Ford appears to be handing out if you are a victim of one of those gaffes of theirs. So if you are that one of those victims, please do send me the legal documentation. And I guarantee that I will take your identity to the grave, but I really do think this kind of thing deserves to be reported, don't you? So there's that. Anyway, Ford Australia is apparently resurrecting the ghost of Pinto at every turn for the past 10 years. Kind of like Jesus, if the Holy Bible were kind of, I don't know, remade in the spirit of the Pirates of Penzance, which you should never do, unless you want to burn in hell for all of eternity. Pro tip. 2017, right? Ford sold just over 78,000 cars here in Shitsville. Last year... 66,000. So that's 78,000 to 66,000 in five years. That's 15% down. And nearly 58,000 of those 66,000 somewhat shit sales were Ranger and its, you know, slightly less masculine sister, the Everest. Ford is betting the farm on essentially one vehicle, right? And that's kind of dangerous if something goes wrong commercially. Not that you care, but Dearborn doesn't give a crap about Ford Australia, obviously, or Australians who own Fords, which would be more relevant to you and me. But the other nine vehicles in the inventory, like 58,000 out of 66,000 vehicles are either Ranger or Everest, there's only another 8,000 sales and they're split among nine different vehicles, depending on how you view their inventory. Can you even name half of those other vehicles in the inventory? And let's not forget, there's a cost involved with carrying the Puma, for example, or the EcoSport in your inventory. And I'd suggest that that cost is not being covered currently. Anyway, they're just a millstone around Ford's neck commercially kind of thing. I'd also suggest that Ford needs Bogans more than Bogans need Ford for the foreseeable future. So, dude, ask not what Centrelink can do for you. Ask instead if enough of you pool your Centrelink entitlements, would it be sufficient to sort of timeshare a brand new XLT Ranger in your street? even if you have to stoop to the two-litre twin-turbo tiny engine with that awful 10-speed transmission. Number eight now, Toyota. Well, when it, it's not Toyota, obviously. Toyota's on top, dude, of the entire market. So Toyota is up there, despite its outdated hybrid tech and despite declaring war on carbon last year, which was the most hilarious automotive incident of 2022. <coughs> they can agree. Despite being the world's best car maker at anti-environmental lobbying, despite the inherent bipolarity of this war on carbon and at the same time selling three of the biggest CO2 belching shitters, the Land Cruiser, the Prado and the mighty Hilux, all champions, darlings of the Dingo Piss Creek Visitation Society. 
you, you know you want to join. You know you'll never join in a Yaris, right? So well done there, Toyota. But what we're talking about here at number eight is Toyota's soulless wannabe prestige sub-brand Lexus. It went poopy in its handbag properly in 2022, the old Lexus. I don't know why. It's hard to come back from that. Poopy in the Birkin. Ask me how I know. That's a wife number four joke. I mean, I did expect to be thanked for the book and just phew, not in that way. Lexus sales, they plummeted in 2022, down almost 25% to just over 7,000. That's enough almost, I think, to make Audi look good. Not really. We'll get to that. Or why don't we get to that now? Number seven. It's a good old-fashioned three-way. Who doesn't want one of those? Poor customer service, bad bill quality, an overarching criminal conspiracy. <laughs> I am, of course, talking about Volkswagen and Audi and Skoda. Tomato, tomato, banana, banana. In the past five years, Volkswagen has fallen from roughly 58,000 sales here in Schittsville to not quite... 31,000. That's almost 50% off, isn't it? Off the pace. Be a conversation with Wolfsburg every month, you know, video link call, the excuses, the non-acceptance of said excuses apropos of non-performance, not giving you that big job when you get back kind of thing, that'd be the subtext. The hastily rebadged Volkswagens now, which rich, let's call them, rhymes with bankers identify as Audis. They managed to large and not quite that solid number two in the Birkin also, down from 22,000 to not even 15,000 sales in five years' time. So Teutonically consistent. And Skoda, which some people love, should have gone to Specsavers. Also on the hunt for some highly absorbent adult underwear with those really, really tight elastic legs. <sighs> After prick teasing us all with more than 9,000 sales in 2021, only to crash by almost 30% to 6,500 sales last year. That's fairly shit. Number six now, Jeep. Where would a list of lemons be? without the venerated seven-slot shit heap. Jeep, the stepchild of Stellantis. Stellantis, of course, the fabled underwater city where consumers could never get a refund, no matter how shit the product they purchased. Jeep's not dead yet, of course, in Australia, but you certainly can smell it coming, let me tell you. They closed out in sales at 6,658 for 2022. 14% down year on year. <laughs> yes, continuing that trajectory, short final. You know, in 2014, they sold 30,408. 30,408 gullible sons and daughters of Anzacs jumped in and bought a Jeep. Then word got around. Number five. Land Rover, Land Rover, it's over. If I was the marketing director, the write-off would be green oval brown trousers. But it's not. One of their shit heaps, I think it's the Range Rover Sport, actually describes itself as, quote, visceral, dramatic, and uncompromising. Kind of like coming down with barley belly on the plane home. The pinnacle of all-terrain marketing masturbation. Visceral, dramatic and uncompromising. Who doesn't want that? Only uh, answer to that question is apparently nobody. Right? Just Google the words Sally, Morphy, M-O-R, P-H-Y and Range Rover to find out why. And they did behave like such abject cocks to Ms. Morphy too. And I think that's pretty much a clear case of Smoke being the harbinger of fire, or at least a solid indicator of fire. TFL Studios uh, multi-defender 
poopy in trow. Uh, reportage probably didn't help either. I can't believe that they, a dealership nicked a wiring harness to fit a bull bar and the whole car had to be thrown away. True story. Couldn't be repaired. Not exactly the same as the Bush Fix Defender from, I don't know, 1945 to just the other day kind of thing. Anyway. You know, it's taken Land Rover's latest owners, the multinational Indian industrial conglomerate Tata. It's taken them 14 years since they picked up Land Rover. It's taken them that long to turn an unreliable, badly supported British icon into an irrelevant, overpriced, unreliable, badly supported British icon. So well done there. Five years ago, just over 13,000 Australian, rhymes with bankers, bought into this green oval hype. Last year, 4,348. That's pretty much what a catastrophic collapse actually looks like. Number four now, Subaru, and it guts me to point this out, it really does, having been the proud and somewhat satisfied owner of Duos, brand new WRXs, which I loved, a Forester XT, which I loved, and also a base model Outback Chitois, which in an odd way, I loved. That was some time ago, though, and the, the past five years has not been kind to Subaru. 52,500 sales have been reduced to just 36,000 in that time. ba -ba. More than anything else, I blame evil mother-loving Toyota bean counters for this, you know, because Toyota owns roughly 20% of Subaru, and in fact, when they upped their stake in Subaru recently, Subaru officially became part of the Toyota group. That occurred on the 10th of February in 2020. Very sad day. Toyota is going to obviously continue to metastasize through Subaru and they're going to do what Mother Levin Toyota bean counters do best, which is just keep cutting out any passion and just replacing it with, you know, aspirations of mediocrity at best. This is the best we can hope for. And the writing of this process is on the wall, and it's been on the wall for ages. I'll just give you some waypoints, right, so you can identify it. The appalling CVT transmissions. When we left behind conventional automatics and basically said goodbye to manuals and just all drove CVT Subarus. No more Forester XT. No more WRX STI, the ultimate halo car. What were they thinking? The complete botch of the first and only Subaru LeVorg. No 2.4 turbo engine in Outback for Australia for years. And when it finally lobs, guess what? It's too little too late. It, like, it just is. Is it any wonder sales are off a freaking cliff? I do believe it's time for the podium. <laughs> The bronze medal, the poop emoji coloured medal for abject automotive commercial shitness goes to, can you guess, Mercedes-Benz. Good old three-prong. Oh, Lord, won't you buy me? <sighs> Base model three-prong shitter. That's a song that's been sung by 10,000 fewer people this year compared with 2017. That's a lot of rich masturbators to turn away, I'd suggest. Sales have tanked. Imagine that. After boning the entire dealer network and then getting sued by them for $650 million for the evisceration of their goodwill, despite three-prong telling us out here in the world that the dealers were... Completely on board with it. Au contraire. Still before the court, no determination's been made. And then, of course, as a consequence of all of this, these shenanigans, they invoke their shit price promise. Yes. That's three prongs real commitment to you. I'd suggest. The rock-solid promise that you will pay 
the shittest possible price, no matter how hard you try to negotiate. Or at which dealer? BMW says, thanks and Happy New Year. And doubtless Audi will also, if they ever manage to emerge from that troublesome coma. The silver medal for shit sales now. Number two in number twos. Can you guess? There's only a couple left, surely. It's Honda. And this is a real achievement, I'd suggest, because most fundamentally incompetent multinational management teams would be unable to turn the inventor of VTech into a complete corporate basket case. And yet, this is what has happened, what Honda has done to itself, seemingly without effort, in the space of fewer than duos decades. So, well done there. And here in Australia, of course, Honda has just completed the first full year of its own shit price promise experiment after it boned its dealers and closed all those dealerships and reorganised the hair and makeup on this and that and made a whole bunch of decisions and, you know, squeezed each other on the buttocks in the boardroom and said, yeah, that'll work. The numbers are in and it hasn't worked. The worst sales performance on record, as in since the 90s when records for this kind of thing were kept here in Australia for the first time. For at least 20 years, you've got to remember, Honda had a seat at the top 10 table among car makers. And in fact, Australian sales peaked at 60,500. That was back in 2007, around the same time as the GFC. Then, of course, the GFC hit us all, Honda included. And what Honda did was it just stuck its head in the sand globally, right? It stopped innovating and basically became the basket case that we see today. Just over 14,000 sales in Australia in 2022, which is less than 25% of where they were in their heyday when they were, in fact, widely viewed as the BMW of the East. $47,000 is the entry price for a base Civic shitter today. That probably hasn't helped. Hashtag shit price promise. And now the moment I've all been waiting for. The lemon-scented poop emoji and the ceremonial decanter of unicorn piss goes to Nissan. 2022 was a complete barry for Nissan Australia. And if you're not from around here, you won't know what that means. But take my word for it, it's bad. A 36% year-on-year sales collapse. That's just full 2022 versus full 2021. 36% down off the back of a cascading cavalcade of year-on-year -year lemming-like off-the-cliff collapses in sales. And if you want to see how profound that is, you have to go back about 10 years. Because 10 years ago, Nissan Australia sales, they nudged 80,000. They, like, they missed it by a bee's dick. Like a metric bee's dick. Like that, the small one. 80,000 sales in Australia. And last year... 26,000. This is essentially what a decade of crap product and couldn't give a crap about innovation and other general mismanagement actually buys you in the car industry because it's so friggin' competitive. It's not as if you leave a void over here and you, you say to yourself, oh, I'll get back to that. It's not going to remain a void for a nanosecond. Someone's going to move in and squat in the space that you had. Someone such as, I don't know, MG or Kia or someone of that nature. It's fascinating to me to see the parallels between Nissan and Honda because on fundamentals, where they were, where they are, the passion they had, the passion they have today, they're marching in lockstep over this cliff and it's amazing to me that not one but two of these great Japanese car makers have fallen so far so quickly. And the only difference between them is, of course, 
the scandal that is inherent in the fall of Nissan versus the lack of scandal for Honda. It's almost just like apathy did Honda in, whereas scandal and political infighting has been one of the main drivers for Nissan. Anyway, if you want to look at where they were, the emblematic moment for me was when Carlos Ghosn was at the top and he was playing his best game ever. Obviously, the pronunciation of his name changed over time. I think he started out as Carlos Gosson, which is kind of how the Arabic name is pronounced. That's according to his sister in a recent documentary. I think he changed it to Goan so that it could be better pronounced, more easily pronounced, by the French when he was a wheel at Renault. And then he moved to Nissan and he became a full-on rock star, which is an inherent contradiction when you look at him when you look at the physicality and the aesthetics and you acknowledge that he was a rock star, he had none of the rock star aesthetic, right? And he did it despite that. Everyone hung off every one of his words. He was the friggin' automotive messiah. And I was one of the people who viewed him that way at the time and I remember his absolute crowning moment was at the 2007 Tokyo Motor Show. There was this extensive automotive uh, AV type reveal of the R35 GTR. And then go and drove it out onto the stage. There's 800 journalists all packed around like this, right? And he jumps out of it and he said, and I want to get this quote right, he said, quote, what you hear is the roar of Nissan's passion for performance. What you see is its ultimate physical expression. And I would be flat out lying to you if I said that there were not 800 TPs in 800 pairs of journalistic trousers around that stage in that moment. And uh, interestingly enough, Simon Spruill, who was the wheel of global PR for Nissan at the time, he refers to that speech in that moment as peak going. Right? So that's when they really had that spark. And it's on YouTube. You should track it down and see it because that's what Nissan was. And that's why I'm so critical of them for what they've become. Because they could have maintained themselves up here. Right? Anyway, if you fast forward 12 years and you think about Goan himself, 12 years later, He's under indictment in Japan. He gets released under house arrest and he hires a team of former special operations dudes to smuggle him out of the country where he would be facing essentially almost certain life imprisonment because once you're charged in Japan, it's very unlikely that you will not be convicted. They've got a 97-something percent conviction rate. Anyway, he's looking down the barrel of that. He's a multimillionaire. He's got resources and... He hires this team of mercs to smuggle him out of Japan in a musical instrument case. You couldn't make this shit up. And he's now, of course, living in exile in Lebanon. Still a rock star to the Lebanese, at least. That was Nissan then, Nissan now, I'd suggest. And if you look at the product range, particularly in Australia, like it's got no passion and its ultimate physical expression is more like we might aspire to mediocrity one day if we're dead set lucky, you know? With the exception of just one vehicle in the lineup, all of Nissan's current vehicle inventory is objectively inferior to its competition. It just is. You can crunch the numbers. You don't even have to drive the vehicles. You can just crunch the numbers and see it, okay? The one exception is the current Patrol, which is as old as the hills. In fact, it kind of reminds me in a sense of Ron Jeremy, right? Like, it's still pretty old, but capable of hardcore performance. And of course, it's heaps cheaper than a 300 series Land Cruiser, right? The Patrol, not Mr. Jeremy. As I understand it, he still commands quite the fee for his work, right? Everything else Nissan is just pathetic and hopeless, right? Leaf, for example, outclassed by other EVs. The X-Trail is essentially a 
not very serious once over lightly attempt at being a mid-sized SUV with at best a hateful CVT, the so-called new Pathfinder. If you subscribe to its alleged newness, then dude, you have not been paying attention. You really haven't. The not really all new Pathfinder, right, is one of the most cynical vehicle launches that I have ever seen. And certainly one of the most cynical that will take place over the next 12 months. And as is anything with the words e-power in Nissan's lineup, right, this is like a whole bunch of engineers get together and they put together a battery hybrid alternative green vehicle type powertrain with less inherent efficiency, lower inherent efficiency than just a freaking ICE powertrain, internal combustion powertrain. Great work, dudes, like if that was your engineering objective. So there you have it, the 10 commercially worst performances in Australia in the automotive sector. Peugeot, Ford, Lexus, Volkswagen and its ugly siblings, Audi and Skoda. Then Jeep, got to have Jeep. Land Rover, ditto. Subaru, like Toyota in waiting. Three Prong, the official sponsor of Satan in hell. Uh, Satan, as I understand it, the architect of the shit price promise for both Three Prong and the silver medalist, Honda, number two, in number twos, well done there. And on top, or is that right down the bottom? Knee friggin' son. Waypoints, all of them, on the road to El Torado, the fabled city of automotive poop. You don't have to take my advice when choosing a vehicle, but if you buy one of those, dude, don't come crying to me. That's on you.